Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depths of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength. That I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Let's open our Bibles, the Gospel of Matthew, the 11th chapter and the 11th verse. Now the Bible says, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. For from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if ye will receive it, this is Elias. Hallelujah. Which was for to come. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. He says, let him hear. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, in scripture, there are things that I believe God has mandated us as a Christendom to embrace and understand and receive and walk with and give ourselves to and allow these things to manifest and work through our lives as the working of God is through his word. But then there are things even Jehovah God knows that not everybody will receive. Not everybody will hear. Not everybody will understand. Not everybody is able to bear certain things. See, there are things that will go for any general knowledge of teaching in the Christendom. As men progressively understand God, there are things some people can and will acquaint themselves with and give themselves to. But there are things that are hard. There are things that are not easy than others. You understand what I'm saying? Like in the normal life of your money, it is easy to eat ice cream than it is to swallow a bitter tablet. Right? One is, one is giving the, the, the body protein and sugar. The other one is trying to heal the body. But one is bitter and one is sweet. And it's easier to take the sweeter stuff and harder to take the bitter stuff. Somebody shout hallelujah. When a child is born, a baby, they don't, they're not given meat because they don't have teeth. And perhaps their stomachs are not even enough strong to break the food, to break meat, to digest it. And so what do they do? They give milk to this child. Somebody shout hallelujah. So there are such things in scripture that sometimes Jesus, God intends to say, you know what, this one is for those who are able <laughs> This one is for those who think they are ready and can receive and hear and understand it. It's meant to be for everybody, but God designs that not everybody will understand and get it. Yet it's available for everyone. But God knows the hearts of men in the gospel. He understands the hearts of men. It's like when some of you have read in the book of Matthew 19-12. He says of eunuchs that they're eunuchs born of men, eunuchs born of God, and eunuchs that make themselves for the sake of the kingdom. And he says, let him who is able receive it. He says, let him who is able receive it. He says, he knows that not everybody is able to receive such realities. Not everybody understands the magnitude and is willing to yield to the power of that scripture. Because that alone tells you that there are things that you received in your mother's womb. That make you a new one by reason of the plans that God has for you before your formed mother's womb. He says, I knew you and I called you to be a prophet. But there are things that make you eunuch because of other men. Will you be humble enough? Will you submit yourself to it? Because where the body of Christ is going, if certain things are not laid down clearly, we are going to lose something very precious in the gospel. And today it's already evident in the way ministries run and the way ministries run. 
Today the strength of churches, many, not all, is politics and money. It's not in the power of God. It is not in the demonstration of His Spirit. It's not in the revelation of His wisdom. And the understanding of His heart. It reminds us of a time in Scripture, as the prophet says, the Bible says they looked at him and they said, because you have clothing, let us follow you. Let us go with thee. Because you have clothing. Before, because you have a nice car, you must be a deep pastor. Because you drive a nice car, because you live in a nice house, ah, you must be deep. Uh, you understand what I'm saying? Because you have this and you have that, and because you have this and because you have that, I think we should follow and that was written at a certain point in history because the word sees that a time would come like that. And that is the place where you see even desperation, even in the body of Christ. In fact, in the next lines he says, seven women will hold on one man and say, we shall get our own food and buy our own clothes. Let us carry your name. That's a church that has lost its own identity. That identity, to get identity, they are paying Prices beyond, if you understand, say amen. Hallelujah. So sometimes, if we don't see and teach certain things a certain way, slowly but surely, the anointing and the operation of the power of the Holy Spirit is leaving our altars. And preachers are becoming counselors, like guys who did psychology. So they're just using human psychology and not the gospel with its answers. Because our altars are getting defined. And until we understand the order of the spirit and understand how God works, like many nations I see sometimes, many people have lost the power. The anointing is not on the altar. They speak and even invent theologies to dispel the power of God. And there are people dying with all sorts of things. Because science has a name for everything. And they are selling drugs and pills and they are sick and bound every day and they don't know. Because they think the vindication of the ministry is who you know and how much you have financially. I'm not saying that the church of Jesus Christ is poor. I'm only saying that there is more to money. There is more to the gospel than money and the influences we have in society. If the gospel does not have power to heal, to deliver, to change, it is not the gospel. It is a worldly secular psychology class or session. And sadly and painfully, the power of God is leaving our altars. Like I said, because we are missing the order of the Spirit. Today, there are things I can do, and somebody runs away from here. One time, I demonstrated power, and two pastors ran out of the church. Theology students, they ran out of the church. Because I don't know who taught them of a Jesus who... <laughs> Which Jesus they know, but the one I know, he opens blind eyes. He cleanses the lepers and raises the dead. He gets viruses out of bodies and kills cancer. The one I know can level valleys. The one I know. Praise God. Somebody shout, the one I know. Amen. Praise God. But there are things that some people are not able. And sadly, even the born again faith is starting to look religious. It's starting to look religious. It starts to smell like religion. It speaks something, but it demonstrates another. That's the spirit of religion. And once men submit themselves to religion, they start to die. They start to die. Somebody shout hallelujah. So there are things that sometimes we ask, are we able to take them? Because if we discern the judgments of God, 
in the understanding of how he runs nations and ministries, you will realize that sometimes it's in the mind of God to let certain things, not to do them, but to let certain things happen, to bring sanity to a people. And I believe that these things are starting to create lines in this dispensation. The Bible says because of their indifference and rejection of knowledge, he says, I've appointed children over them. Some people, some ministers are like babies. They're like babies. If you go on social media, you'll understand what I'm saying. But a time has come where God must give us a godly, mature people. Somebody shout hallelujah. Where if somebody says they are a father, they are really a father. And they're not only a father of their church, but they are a father to a nation. Praise God. They can instruct young women, they can instruct young men in the way that they should go. Praise God. And those days are coming, <laughs> not far from now, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. But there are things that some people are able to take and there are some things people are not able to take. There are things certain people are able to hear. But there are certain things that certain people are not able to hear. That's why the Bible says, take heed what you hear and how you hear. You can preach the gospel. You can read. You can speak the word as the Lord has given. But you see, there are some people, sadly, who don't have a spiritual ability to understand certain things a certain way. But some do. Now this, this scripture is one of those sorts. It's like the seven churches in the book of Revelation. He speaks of the church. He says, let him who has ears hear what the Spirit is saying. He speaks of another church. Let him who has ears hear what the Spirit is saying. Let him who has ears hear what the Spirit is saying. That is why when you go back to Matthew 11, where I was reading, he says, let him who has ears, let him hear. He says, but where unto shall I can this generation? Now Jesus is speaking of this thing. He says, it is like unto children sitting in the markets, calling unto their fellows and saying, we have fought unto you and you have not danced, and we have mourned unto you and you have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, they say, the other devil. Because he was out of the box of predictable. When Jesus says the Son of Man came eating and drinking, they said, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine biber, a friend of publicans and sinners. He says, But wisdom is justified of her children. He said, You see, not everybody who, who lived in the days of John understood the wisdom on John. If John the Baptist was walking like any other person, said, No, 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 he's a fellow, certain fellow. He eats locusts and honey. He lives in the desert. He doesn't have a life. The guy doesn't even have any plans for his life. He doesn't look like he has a job. He doesn't look like he has any position. He's not a bishop. You understand? He didn't drive a certain way. He didn't live a certain way. He's putting on funny. He's somewhere screaming. Repent ye, the kingdom of God is nigh. Repent ye, for king, the kingdom of God is here. Repent ye, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He's screaming somewhere. And the Bible says, I seems that guy has a devil. Because you see, the standard of the people they called men of God in that time. They looked differently. The Pharisee looked differently. The Sadducee looked differently. The Eastern looked differently. And there's this crazy guy somewhere screaming, Repent for the kingdom of God is on hand. Praise God. And then they invent other lines of fastings and washings and a certain diversity of things that define piety and the fear of God. You remember that guy who says, you know, I thank you, God, because I'm not like the other guys. I fast, I pray, I give a tithe of my coming and everything. But those guys are like sinners, you understand? So they also had a standard of what they call relationship with God. And they find the Son of God eating and drinking and say, ah, this guy is a glutton and a wine biber. Oh, how can he say he's holy and he's the Son of God sent to redeem mankind and he's eating with publicans? This is Beelzebub. Why? Because those two individuals, which had embraced the kingdom reality, started to look strange from men to whom the kingdom was not revealed. The Bible says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. If you are still in the flesh, if you're 
still relating to blood. You cannot understand the things that are spoken. He says, look, let him who has an ear, let him hear. Let him hear. Because behind the message, there is a message. Behind what is preached, there is a preaching. Behind what we cause men to understand, there is a deeper understanding. There is a hidden understanding in God that you and I have to have. That we have to have. The purposes of God are fully revealed in our spirit. The Bible says that he has made known unto us the mystery of his will. We are not of them trying to say, oh, what will happen in 20 years? What will happen in 20 years? We, we, it's somewhere. But, but you can ask me, Apostle, how? Because I don't see it. Yes, you don't need to see it to believe it. If the word says he has made known unto you the mystery of his will, he has. Somebody said, hallelujah. If the word says he has made known unto you, he has. But how many people carry the understanding to dig that thing out? How many of us understand what it means to move in tune with the Holy Spirit, in line with God's will and purpose in a different dispensation? Our pattern, Lord, is not drawn until this is revealed. John the Baptist played his part, and Jesus tells them, look, if you're able to take it, this is Elijah. How? There's already a huge confusion. You move around and understand how they're saying it. You remember when he asked them, what do men say I am? Oh, some say you're Elias. Some say you're one of those prophets. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Jeremiah. You're, you're something. Everybody has a suspicion of who what somebody is. They were so crooked in understanding that even Jesus was not understood. Now he tells them, look, you might think it's easy for you to embrace, but it's not easy. And I'm going to say, share a few things in a few minutes. So you'll understand why certain people might not have the ears for this thing. He says, okay, he's Elias, he's Elijah. Receive it, understand it, believe it if you want. This is the one who has to come. He comes in the spirit of Elijah. But Jesus, of course, knows that he will not understand him. Because they are complaining. They are still in the small little lines of when I mourned, you did not lament with me. When I sang and played the harp, you did not dance with me. They are still cutting small little wires of I'm not your friend because you didn't attend my graduation party. You <laughs> oh, God. How can I send you a message and you don't reply? <laughs> anyway. Praise God. Somebody shout hallelujah. But then he says, but you see, what justifies John the Baptist and Jesus Christ is wisdom. He's saying, the world missed it. Many people, not all, but many people missed what was going on in John the Baptist's head. There was a wisdom of God that made him that way. There was a wisdom of God that made the Christ that way. That is why when we discuss the yoke in the present truth, we're talking about what you learn by the Spirit. He says, take ye of my yoke and learn of me. The yoke of Christ is a teaching grace. It is something that reveals the way of the Spirit. It is the thing that defines the warrior and the fighter, the strong man by the standard of spiritual authority. That's why he says the kingdom suffereth violence. And the violent take it by force. Th that scripture has been grossly abused in the church. When you read that scripture, people go to generational curses. So you mean to say that from the days of John, that's when generational curses took effect? You mean to say generational curses did not exist before the time of John? What are you saying now in that dispensation from the time of John till now as the kingdom separate violence is there that was not there before? Are you talking of sick sickness? Men were sick before. Are you talking of poverty? Poverty has been with men for many years. Are you talking of witchcraft? No. You just think that your time is where witchcraft is. No. The world has had witchcraft for so long. For so long. Men of old had small little gods. Your father Abraham worshipped the sun. It's not new. So 
sorcerers existed. You read one in the book of Acts, Simon the sorcerer. It's not news. He's not talking about that thing of your cousin which is disturbing you, that thing of your grandfather which is attacking you, and then you say, you have to be violent. Fire! 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 And some of them call themselves intercessors. No, no, intercessors. Their voices died. They scream! And I'm not saying I have a problem with you screaming. But scream in revelation. Intercede in understanding. Groan in wisdom. Somebody shout hallelujah. You know, you look at a person and they're from prayer and they look beaten. And like, but this is not supposed to be prayer. Prayer is not supposed to be a place where somebody comes back and they look sick. I was fighting. I was fighting the devil. <laughs> the violence taketh it by force. Somebody shout hallelujah. Thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph and maketh manifest the shadow of his knowledge by us in every place. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now the Bible says that the kingdom of God suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. The word violent there is strong men. He's talking about the strength of men who are warriors by the spirit. Who have overcome something by the spirit. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now when the Bible says let him who has an ear hear. In uh, Revelations 2.17. And then it says unto him that shall overcome. Why does he use the word overcome? He, he gives an impression of access, a sort of a war. And the man that carries victory to access the hearing of what many don't hear, the seeing of what many don't see. The Bible calls that man a strong man. The Bible calls him a warrior. Being a spiritual warrior is not rebuking a devil out of a sister. That's not the things that cause us to rejoice. He says, rejoice not that the devils respond to you. But that you understand and, and respond to the things of the kingdom. Somebody shout hallelujah. That you understand that your name is somewhere. Some people think the end of it is just, oh, no, rebuke, rebuke. No, no, no. It's more than that. Is your name in the kingdom of heaven? Is it written somewhere? In the members of the spirit. That your authority goes beyond just simply. Man, our responsibility is bigger. The results of our responsibility are the casting out of devils and cleansing the lepers. And making lame men walk, getting them out of the wheelchairs and raising the dead. That's just the, the results of our responsibility. But our responsibility is bigger. And sadly, some people have not understood this responsibility. And therefore, they are not acquainted to true ministry many of them have centered their ministry on the gift or the revelation that is revealed to them at the climax oh he prayed for a sick person and then the person was healed and then his ministry is for healing no but some people get stuck there you heal the person and then you heal two people and then you heal three people and then your ministry became a healing ministry and then you got stuck in healing you took the mandate of the gift and called it ministry. Uh-huh. And then the question, so when all of them are healed? Oh, no, your, your deliverance ministry. Uh-huh. So when all of them are delivered and they're free, what, what else will you do? To continue ministry, you'll have to put them in bondage again to stay relevant. Somebody said Hallelujah. We cannot zero. That's why I tell people, oh, we are not just grace ministers. When you say grace, you, is that all? It's all, all about righteousness imputed and forgiveness through sins. Is that all? No, there is more. Grace and message is not just on the righteousness imputed. It's deeper than that. Okay, what if now the church comes to that realization and all of them understand the righteousness imputed by faith? What else shall we preach? No, no, me, that's my mandate. No, you got stuck there. The spirit is still moving. God is deep and bottomless. 
And every other day he's ready to reveal deeper things in him. Otherwise we are going to get stuck in healing. And Jesus is coming back. And men are not yet ready. We're going to get stuck in deliverance. And instead of men moving beyond to understand the true purpose and re responsibility of why they were ordained, a guy is still breaking things off his life. 50 years, fire, break, go. 70 years, fire, break, go. 80 years, fire, break, go. And 100, the guy died. And they say, he was a fighter. What does it mean? What does it mean to be a strong man? What does it mean to be a fighter? What? He says, fight the good fight of faith. He says, lay hold of eternal life. Lay hold of eternal life. Paul says, I have fought a good fight. Uh -huh. What was it? Was it getting a bunch of believers and joining hands and saying, fire for the devils in Nankola? Demon spirits of boy, get it. Fire. No. Yes. So when you say that, no, these guys don't believe in deliverance. Bring someone with a devil. I will show you. No, it's not that we don't believe in a deliverance. But ministers, many men of God, we are getting stuck. The brooks are drying so early. The voices are becoming echoes. We're drinking from waters of other men. The, the things that starts new things is dying. And now we're starting to look predictable. Like Nigerian movies. No offense. But when a Nigerian movie begins, you know who's going to die. Even when a woman is coming out of a car, you know that she's an evil stepmother. Before she does anything. <laughs> ah, Jesus Christ. Praise God. Praise God. Are you following? So, he tells him, fight the good fight of faith. He tells him, lay hold on eternal life. Lay hold on eternal life. Lay hold on eternal life. Lay hold. Get it. Catch it. That's what he's saying. But the kingdom of God suffers violence. And the violent, the strong, take it by force. Let me share something interesting. When you read the, the Greek from where the English comes, the word take it and by force are one and the same. So actually in the original Greek, the Bible says the kingdom of God, since the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it. That word by force is not in the Greek. It's a repetition of the word take. They seize it. So, but when you hear by force, <laughs> oh, uh, when, when you find some people who understand by force, you understand it? <laughs> Are you following what I'm saying? It's actually on the violent, take it. In other words, the violent, grasp it. The strong in the spirit, get this thing. And when they get it, when they get it, wisdom is justified. Responsibility comes. Certain things are revealed. They have a pattern lot in the story of the gospel. There is nothing as painful as one day getting before our Lord Jesus after all is done. And then you stand before him. And there was no work in your name. You are just a surviving mother who comes every Thursday, says that your children stop playing in class. You're just a guy who used to come every Thursday because for three years you failed to find a job. And there's this guy who speaks words you like. So you come every Thursday and listen. You're just that student who just lived near the meeting and it was easy to slow on Thursday. Oh, you were born in a poor family and poverty started smelling on you. And you started coming and made these rich people here. Such that you can... <laughs> no, no, we are rich. Tell your neighbor we are rich. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Now, if you think you're poor, you're the one I'm talking about. <laughs> if you think you're poor, you're the one I'm what? Talking about. But there is more in God than what we are saying. There is more in God. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life. And this is life eternal. That they might know the one true God and his only son Jesus. That's life eternal. To know him. 
And when he's talking about strong men, he's talking about people who, who yield to the Spirit of God and pay every price to know him a certain way. Not just to know him, but to know him a certain way. The Bible says in Psalm 37, verses 23, he says that the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. And he delighteth in his way. The good man delighteth in the way of God. In the way of God. Not the ways, the way. There's a difference between the way and the ways. Right? The ways is the things, the way, the ways is, is the manifold things that manifest by him to prove his person. But the way is the mind behind the things he does. You, you, you got the difference. The way is, is his mind in doing the things he does. Are you following? He says a good man. And amazingly, the Hebrew word there for good man is the very, very word in the Greek. Right? Now, in the Hebrew there, the word is geber. And geber means a strong man. The steps of a strong warrior are ordered by the Lord. They are ordered by the Lord. If you understood this, you'd understand what, what it means to be led by the Spirit. Let me explain this. There are many people in this world who, who don't know how to respond to the light of the Spirit and the lamp. You know the Bible says the lamp, your word is a lamp unto my feet and the light unto my path. The, the lamp lights the feet to give you your next step in, in God and the light shines your path to see where you're going. Right? And both of those things are important. In fact, in one account, Job laments and he says, what is it for a man who has a light, but his paths are not lit? They are not, they're hid. His ways are not, the, 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 the way is hid from him. What, what is it? Why is it, how important is it for God to illuminate on you when you cannot see your next step in the gospel? What is the use of that anointing? What is the use of God revealing to you things when you don't see where you're going as a person? Are you following what I'm saying? And each one of us, believe me, every man on this ground groans in their heart personally to say, you know what, I want to walk in your perfect will. I want to make every step of the way count. I want to go where you want me to go. I want to sit where you want me to sit. I want to listen to what you want me to listen to. I want to deal what you want me to deal. I want to do the job you want me to, to, to do. I want to marry this person you want me to marry. I want, at least I want to. That's a place of men who are dead enough. Because I have seen in this life that hunger and lust have remarkably similar interventions. They have similar responses. When a man is lusting, you can think he's hungry. You can look at two men, both, one is lusting and another one is hungry for the same thing. Are you hearing me? And you look at both of them and when they are praying, you can think that both of them are seeking the same thing. But one of them is lusting and another one is hungry for God. Hunger and lust look the same unless you enter the hearts of men to desire. You think that people never used to bless their apostles of long ago. They used to. The Bible tells even Paul says for the church in Philippi, they communicated to me all my needs when I was in Thessalonica, right? Now Simon the Sosa, some fellow, the Bible says he gets born again, he follows everywhere. They're going both, they're all going with him. And the Bible says he sees them laying hands on, the, on people and they're receiving the Holy Spirit. And he says, oh, he gives them money. He says, have money that I might receive the Spirit also, that when I lay hands on somebody, they will also receive the Spirit. This was a lasting man. He also gave, like other people gave to the anointing. Are you hearing me? But one, someone was driven by hunger for the responsibility in God, and others were driven by the last of the things they saw operating on the men of oil. It's easy to see an anointing and last for it. Some people who are lasting think, if you enter their brains, they are convinced that they are hungry for God. 
Because they will do the things hungry men do. A man Alaskan can fast. A man Alaskan can even die for it. Corinthians have told you, even if you give your body to be burnt but have not love, it's because God through the lens of the Spirit has seen men who have given themselves to even die but they were not dying for truth. He says, even if you give your goods to the poor but have not love, you're nothing. Because there are seen men who are giving and giving and giving but they are lasting. But who taught us to hunger? Everything they exposed us before was lust. They told us, you know, when you seek God, the anointing will come. When you seek God, doors will open. When you seek God, your finances will come. Why are we seeking God? For our finances to come. Why are we seeking God? For the oil to increase. Why are we seeking God? For more doors to open so we step in more nations and more Americans, British, Irish people, and then everybody else, the, 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 the Asians, and everybody here has the gospel. And you know, there's this young man right now on Prayer Mountain. Why? Because he has seen a certain guy who God opened a wonderful door for, and he saw him on television, and he lost sleep and peace. But he doesn't know that he's actually lasting, because he doesn't know the price and the responsibility of what he's asking for. He doesn't understand it. He doesn't know that he has to die. He doesn't know that he'll have to count all things but loss. For the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, for whom he'll count all things but dung, that he may win him. He does not know that he'll have to be the least of all if he wants to be the greatest. He doesn't understand that the gospel requires service. He doesn't get it. But he's also lasting and he thinks he's hungry. The Bible says and they pray and receive not because they want to consume it on their last. It's about them. No. Read Simon the Sorcerer. He says, give me that power also, such that whosoever I lay hands on, they will receive the Spirit. Simon, who told you that it's just about you laying hands on men to receive the Spirit too? To which end? The Holy Ghost was not sent, so that it settles on you, selfish Simon. So that you also release it on other people. Because then Simon had the thought that he would own the gift of God and take advantage of it and use it whatsoever way he wanted because it was available to him. That is not how so we've learned Christ. There's a responsibility that reveals the heart of God. And that is the challenge we're having in this dispensation. It's the things we fear to say but are real. We no longer see transgenerational anointings. We don't see inheritances on sons. It's associated. These little small things, it's even ministries, they're like businesses. There's nothing different from ministries and many, many, many businesses. It's CEOs and team leaders and then they, you, you are responsible for this and responsible for that. The way a small little business is run is the way churches are run now. There's no covenant relationship. There's no understanding and accountability in the, in the things of God. The spirit and his order is not depicting. And so, why are our ministries getting frustrated? Why is the church every day becoming like normal businesses? Why are the people outside saying, Oh, but local pastors are businessmen. Because we look like businessmen. We look like businessmen. Until God raises something in, in a nation, in a generation, where a voice is spoken and says, no, this is not a business person, no, this is a giver of life. And maybe we lasted and we did not have any other example. What was that to show us how to walk? We're simply walking after the dictates of how we found it working and what was given there. How many people, oh, seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And this young man says, all these things? No, no, not the kingdom and this was All these things? You mean I can get a car? You mean I can get a house? You mean I can get money? You mean I can go to America? You mean I can come back? You mean I can do this? You mean everything? As long as I seek him. Here, let me seek him. Are you following Ladies and gentlemen, that is lust. It's not hunger. It's not hunger. And then you find hungry men <laughs> who are so dead that by the time the things followed them, they were not even conscious of what was following. Because they were following somebody. They were after something. Why are you here? Why do you come every Thursday? 
Why do you pray every Sunday? What are you following? Who are you really following? Why are you giving? Why are you fasting? Why are you praying? Why are you serving? To get out of poverty. You understand what I'm saying? And you know who examines that? Not the man on the pulpit. It's the God who searches the heart. Chronicles 69, it says, The eyes of the Lord look to and fro, seeking to show himself strong on the man whose heart is perfect with him. He will show himself strong, a strong man. The Lord will direct his ways. Did you get it? He will give strength to the man whose heart is perfect toward him. And because the man of God dealt not well with that, the Bible says, from henceforth you shall have wars. And that's the life of many believers. Their whole life is full of wars. Poverty wars, sickness wars. They are coming out of one thing to enter another. They are breaking and killing. They are moving church to church, fellowship to fellowship, house to house, man of God to man of God, prophet to apostle, apostle to teacher, teacher to evangelist. Why? Because they want some things to leave them. They have war. They... And that war won't cease. They don't get it. And they've been casting and praying for 20, 30 years and nothing is changing and it still doesn't sink in their head that you have walls in your court because there's something in your heart. You're lusting for what you're supposed to be hungering for. And because you're not hungry, you're seeking a thing without the responsibility thereof. You're asking for a meat without the maturity for it. And that's how our churches are becoming the way they are. That now somebody can say something so ungodly and people are screaming. Someone can break a system God ordained and people are screaming. And even giving him money. It's so sad. And you can't even speak because if you do, hey, oh, you're attacking. Do you understand what I'm saying? No. But what is happening to the church? Don't you see there's something wrong? People of God, don't you see there's something wrong? How can we boast for wrong? How can we boast for sin? How, how can we boast? We're supposed to be sorrowful. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. Repentance is supposed to be on our altars, men of God. Repentance is supposed to come back to our altars, ministers. We're supposed to really be sorry. And then also there is a bunch of people who feel God has called them to be the prefect of the church. They think that they're the headmasters of present truth and the principles of doctrine. And he taught us the way of the spirit. He says, brethren, if a man is overtaken by fault, if you claim to be spiritual, where is your meekness? There's another one attacking the wrong thing because he sees the right thing. But he's not doesn't see the right thing in the right heart. He's also taking advantage because of an overtaken fellow to also now also raise his head to say, now me, I'm the one who knows the truth. Leave that guy and come. <laughs> Are you following what I'm saying? So there is even that which seeks to redeem, but its heart is not in redemption. No, it's acting to redeem to those who are gullible and weak because they cannot tell the difference. You understand what I'm saying? The church requires a certain meekness too. When we are restoring the fallen, we have to be a bit humble men of God. And let's consider ourselves. Least you be tempted also. There are many things in some men's doors that they crucified on other men's windows. You understand? It? There are some things in some people's homes that they one time pointed fingers on. Say that one. He's busy. <laughs> They even mention names and names of men's ministries because they don't walk in love. Kenneth Hagin told me that. He said, if you have an issue, present it in line with the word. If you walk in love, don't mention the minister and the name. Try as much as possible not to do that because you're going to kill. You understand what I'm saying? But again, it does not mean that the church does not have authority to restore. We do have the authority to restore. But you see, also, it requires a certain level of maturity. I mean, in the book of Corinthians, you see Paul saying, I'm coming that we judge a certain matter. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But 
They were able and mature to judge it. Many of our people, their heart is not able. They seek in the place of reconciliation and restoration, yet they seek to kill. God help us. God help us. Somebody said hallelujah. And now we have a sea of many young men and women who have dreams to serve God. And many of them don't even know where to begin from. Because many of them have breastfed from many things. It is so sad. God help us. Praise God. The steps of a strong man are ordered of the Lord. They are ordered of the Lord. They are ordered of the Lord. Because the man delights in the way of the spirit. He understands the mind of God. That means as far as the mind of God is revealed to you, your steps are ordered. How do I know which next step to do? Just learn to sit in the mind of God. Learn to meditate in the word of God. Learn to read the word of God. When you are a reader of the word of God, your steps will be ordered. You, you will know what to do, when to do it, how to do it. You won't need someone to fly in and giving you a prophetic word. And I'm not saying prophecy doesn't have its place. It does have its place. But pro the place of prophecy in the New Testament is confirmation, not affirmation. The spirit is our leader. But how many people don't even carry the affirmation? But they need... Confirmation of what is not affirmed, that even when they are deluded and deceived, they don't know the difference. How many marriages are breaking? In the name of God spoke to me. How many ministries are breaking? In the name of me, God revealed, I know what he has said. How many businesses have died, but I, but I had the voice of God? Why, why has it failed? Woman, you had yourself. You had yourself. Your voice was too loud for your ears. The voice of your heart was too loud for the ears to hear. And then you thought it was God speaking. The voice of God comes with a certain vindication. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Say, I understood why. He says that the steps of a strong man are ordered of the Lord. A good man. The goodness there is the step of a warrior. The warrior that has learned. And that is why when he goes down in the very scripture, right? Though he fall. He shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his right hand. And the Bible says, I have been young. Now that is what he says. And now I am old. And he says, and I have never seen the righteous forsaken. Nor his seed begging bread. And they end there. But they don't understand that the word in the righteous is what saves him. Because the next line says, next line, next line. He says, he is ever merciful. Number one. And he learned it. That means he's a giver. And his seed is blessed. Why is his seed blessed? Because he's a giver. He didn't mean to say that because he has the righteousness of God imputed on him. And the word of God is not working in him. But he has righteousness imputed on him by faith. Therefore his seed will not beg bread. No, no. Your seed will beg bread regardless of how much righteousness is imputed on you. If you don't understand that that righteousness imputed on you translates to the knowledge of his will. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Verse 30, he says, the mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of judgment. And the next verse says, the law of his God is in his heart, and none of his steps shall slide. Why is none of his steps not sliding? Because the word of God is in his spirit. Ours are translating to witchcraft. Father, reveal to me the way. You have the way. He says, I'm the way. I am the truth. He says, I'm the life. Nobody gets to the Father except through me. Get into your word. You'll know the way. Get into the word. You'll know what to do, when to do it. Because the principles of the Spirit are clear. To lead every man, he says that this is a sure word of prophecy of which you do good to hit too as a light that shines in darkness until the day dawn and the day star shines in your heart. How does it shine? What is this light that comes through? It comes through the knowledge of the glorious gospel. We want them saved, yes, but we have to transition to them getting knowledge. He says he wills that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But after salvation, men cast out, cast out devils and break and break and kill. Now, more so sadly in Africa, our churches are starting to look like shrines. Shrine. The yeah, apostle, you don't know the problems I have. No, listen. Jesus bore all your problems. 
You need to know that. Hallelujah. Somebody said hallelujah. So I started to discover that our war, the violence of the spirit, is supposed to be in how much we give ourselves to the world. I wish we know how to fight. Men of war, strong warriors who overcome, to whom God gives a name and writes their names on white stone and keys of the hidden manner, like the book of Revelation says, are men who have learned to overcome the godly way. And what does it mean to overcome the godly way? The true warrior is a man who tarries by the word. We fight that way. Fight the fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life. How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So as I receive the word of God, faith comes. Then I am fighting. I'm laying hold of eternal life. What is eternal life? To know the one true God and his only son, Jesus. In Luganda, to a Kalakas is a Muchigambo. If you're rioting, writing knowing God. Hallelujah. If you call yourself fervent, be a reader of the word. People have to stop reading the word for you. At one particular point, you might have to get the word. Somebody said, Hallelujah. Woman of God, I don't care how many days you're going to go for deliverance, how many prayers you need, but at one particular point, honey, you're going to have to open that Bible and get your man back home. We are tired of you, because oh, please pray. He disappeared. Bring him back. Hallelujah. Get into the word and say, I'm out in the name of Jesus. Rakasata. Robosa. Why? Because the word of God says. Get back your jobs in the name of Jesus. Build back your ministries, pastors, through the word. Hallelujah. Get back your wives and children. Receive them back. The Bible says by faith, women receive back their dead. How did faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Stop being a crybaby and a mourner of the streets asking for people to pray for you. Monday to Sunday to Tuesday to Wednesday. Get into the word yourself. Tell your neighbor, read it for yourself. When you call the man of God, call him telling him, man of God, join me, I'm in the middle of war. But I've already started. I'm reading the scriptures. I'm reciting the Psalms. I'm a reke sobrata. That's someone you can fight with. But you can't fight with someone who doesn't even know. Who can't quote a scripture. 20 years in the gospel, you can't even quote the word. Everything you're quoting is twisted. And then you ask yourself, why things are not a, eh, they that tarry on the wine. What does the Bible say? What, what is the wine? <laughs> on the spirit. The Bible says, for the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and life. Unfortunately, the world also created its spirit. But he's drinking a spirit. But he says, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and their life. There is another way to get drunk. Hallelujah. It's through the Holy Ghost and in the revelation of his word. May God cause you to be drunk in the word. May you wake up in the morning and say, I am exceedingly, abundantly above. It's inside me. Exceeding. The path of the righteous shines brighter and brighter unto a perfect. Oh, My parts are dropping with greatness. You're saying the lines are falling unto me in pleasant places. And I have a goodly heritage. Oh, yeah, Rabba calls. That's a fighter. That's a strong man. That's a warrior. That's a warrior. We have to stop waiting on people to control our destiny. What if he's not there? What if he's in America? You have to wait for him. You have to send him a message. He has to respond to your WhatsApp. If he doesn't respond to your email, you're dying. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I did not die for you. I did not shed my blood at Calvary. It is still in the attack. My heart is still bleeding. There is nothing in my hands. I was not pierced. Looking unto Jesus, which is the author and the finisher of your faith. Read the Read the word. Sit around men who talk the word. Encourage yourself around people who know the word. Your best friend should be someone who knows. 
Somebody shout hallelujah. Pastors, we no longer have time to play movies in church. People are dying. Somebody shout hallelujah. Me, if we are not talking the word, I'm not interested. I'm not. Because the, the problems in the world are too many. If you don't know me by the word, it's okay. Go get another friend. Are you hearing me? Why? Because I have a responsibility to this generation. And we are losing another one until somebody preaches God a certain way. You will know the truth. And the truth will make you free. When I encountered the spirit of revelation, when I encountered the spirit of revelation, I was amazed at how much power was available. I was amazed at how much... You think people just come to Fanero for Thursday? No. There is an atmosphere. You feel it in the air. There is something in the spirit that speaks more than I'm speaking on this altar. And that thing cannot be taught in Bible school. It can only be built by a relationship of a man who can explain his altar. The relationship you have with God and with his word. Let us fall in love with the word again. Let us buy Bibles. Let us download them on our phones. Let us put them on our computers. Let us quote the Psalms. I told people WhatsApp is an altar. It's not a show off for carnal men. Put a scripture. Encourage somebody. Your statuses. Let them minister the gospel. Surround yourself around the word. Carry around the wine longer. The Bible says, and your eyes will become what? Red. When a man surrounds themselves around the word, so much. Something in his eyes changes. He starts to see the world a certain way. Things start responding to you. Believe me, it's a small thing that you want your son to leave drugs. It's a small thing that you want your husband to stop drinking. Get the bigger picture. He has anointed you to save nations, woman. He has anointed you to redeem generations. Get the bigger picture. That is why Fanero came. To make men hungry. Fanero is a gathering of men who are hungry for the word. Yes, their needs are met. Yes, they are blessed. Yes, breakthrough comes. But primarily, they come for God. May God make us hungry. Come on, raise your hands and speak to God. Come on. This is eternal life. In the secret, the quiet place. You don't need a job. You need the revelation of Jesus Christ. You don't need a new car. With it and without him, you're nothing. You need the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, and the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus. There is grace and favor that comes. Yet we are not seeking the favor and grace, but we are seeking the revelation because the heart of God is revealed to us. I want to know you. I want to hear I want to know you more. I 
the world will look for. One man said, one man wrote and said, if you read this thing and give yourself to it long enough, men will want to say what you say. May God through you create imitation of the spirit and people after who are after his heart and his kind may God give you something that will cause men to look and when they come looking you will show them Christ that is all you need may God teach you to war may God teach you to believe his word may God teach you to search it out May that person, may you burn the oil at night. May you sleep late seeking his word. May you separate yourself from the movies and television just to know him. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. The Lord saying, said, if you're sick in your body, I want you to touch why it's raining right now. God is healing you. I rebuke and I bind and destroy the spirit of infirmity and disease. Every spirit of infirmity and disease. Every spirit of infirmity and disease. We decree life. We decree life in the name of Jesus. Your families are blessed. Your careers are blessed. Your businesses are blessed. Your going in is blessed as you're going out. Your families and children, they're all aligned to the will and word of God in the name of Jesus Christ. You will not fail. You will not struggle. In the name of Jesus. And God is going to use you mightily. Now if you're here and you've never given your life to Christ. And you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You're going to repeat with us after me. Say Lord Jesus. Tonight. I receive you. As my Lord. And Savior. I believe. That you died. For my sin. And you are raised. From my glory tonight I have accepted you I give you my life I belong to you amen the message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International for more information contact us on telephone number 041 466 4291 or email us at the at gmail.com you can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org or better still feel free to join us every thursday for our weekly fellowship at uma multipurpose hall from 5 p.m to 8 p.m you can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest